Throughout history, thinkers have held rather opposite views of how reason works and whether it works well or not. So to give you um, two extreme examples, on the one hand, you can have someone like René Descartes, who granted reason the power of judging correctly and of distinguishing the true from the false. And on the other hand, you have someone like Martin Luther, who had a slightly more colorful language, and who, for instance, said, uh, reason is by nature a harmful whore, but she shall not harm me if only I resist her. Ah, but she is so comely and glittering. See to it that you hold reason in check and do not follow her beautiful cogitations. Throw dirt in her face and make her ugly. But something that actually both of these thinkers and, and most other thinkers have agreed on is that reason is quite powerful. So if you take the work of Daniel Kahneman, uh, Jonathan Evans, or Keith Stanovich, and many others who have worked on the uh, dual process models, you, in a way you still find some respect for the power of reason. So this is in a way the kind of typical analogy you can use for dual process models of the mind. The mind would be this iceberg, and the vast majority of the mind would be the uh, submerged part of the iceberg, you know, made up of unconscious processes that we are not aware of. And, uh, and indeed, the work of, of Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, and, and many other psychologists have shown that these intuitions can be quite biased and can lead to quite systematic mistakes. That's one of the reasons why we have the tip of the iceberg, which is made up of conscious processes, uh, which includes reason, and reason then would have as one of its main functions to check and to correct the biases of the intuitions. So that's what we've called the um, standard or the uh, intellectualist uh, view of reason, which states really that the main function of reason would be to help uh, lone reasoners correct their mistaken intuitions. I'm now uh, going to give you one of the many reasoning problems that um, psychologists use to, you know, to probe reason and to try to understand how it works. A tea and a biscuit cost one pound and ten pence together, and the tea costs uh, one pound more than the biscuit. There is an intuitive answer, which is ten pence, that I would guess most of you, if not all of you, have thought of, uh, which is wrong, uh, because if uh, the biscuit costs ten pence, then the tea would cost one dollar more, which is one dollar and ten pence, and the two of them together would cost one dollar and twenty pence, which is not what you want. Um, so instead, the biscuit has to cost five pence, uh, then the tea costs uh, one pound and five pence, and the two of them together cost one pound and uh, ten pence. So uh, the reason that this, you know, this kind of problem is so fascinating, except that you know, we, we like to see people failing, but <laughs> it's that uh, it tells us that you, know, you have this wrong intuition. You have you know, this, kind of this picture of the iceberg. You have the intuition that is driving you towards the wrong answer, the ten pence answer. And then thanks to reason, you can realize that ten pence is wrong, and you can uh, reach the correct answer of five pence. But if you give that problem to most groups of participants, so you know, typically college students, they know the math to solve this. Um, and still most of them fail. That's the first problem for this standard view of reason, which says that you know, reason should help you correct mistaken intuitions. And on that problem and many, many other problems like this one, it just fails, even though all the tools that you need to get at the right answer are kind of really within your reach. So if you take the standard view of reasoning with this function of helping us correct mistaken intuitions, then what you, want, what you would want a reason to do is to make sure that you have good reasons for your intuitions, maybe see if there are some reasons that might go against your intuitions, maybe see if there are alternatives that might be better uh, than what you thought of initially. Reason doesn't do this. Instead, reason has a massive uh, confirmation bias, or uh, what I think we should call the really my side bias, which means that when people are faced with this type of problem, if you have some kind of preconceived ID, some intuition about the problem, then reason is going to mostly find arguments and justifications for that intuition. Uh, when you give them the problem, they think of 10 pence, and then if they reason about the problem at all, mostly they will find reasons why 10 pence is the right answer, <coughs> rather than kind of critically examining whether that is the case or not. And so, first of all, uh, we, we kind of looked at how many people got it right. So the vast majority of them got the problem wrong. They gave the 10 cents answer. And then we also asked them how confident they were in their answer. So they had a scale between uh, 0 and 10. And they're pretty sure they had it right. So <laughs> and, and then we asked participants to turn towards their neighbors and to talk with them to see if they, could, if they disagreed or not about the answer and if they disagreed to try to reach a consensus. You know, it's kind of tricky because you have like a very, very small minority of the participants who got it right. And they're faced with an overwhelming majority who not only all got it wrong in the same way, but they're extremely confident that they got it right. Uh, so that's you kind know, of the classroom. Each square is one participant. 
Um, the black squares are just kind of empty seats. As you can guess, the two uh, green squares are those two participants who had gotten it right after about five minutes of solitary reasoning. And all the other red ones are those who had gotten it wrong. And then they had about um, 10 or 15 minutes uh, where they could reason. And every minute, we were kind of asking them what they thought was the right answer so we could track uh, what was happening during the discussion. And, uh, let me tell you, as, as far as psychology experiments are concerned, this is nice. But on the whole, this pattern of you know, people who have the right answer being able to convince those who have the wrong answer is extremely robust. It is the most, maybe the most robust thing I know in experimental psychology. It also works well in softer settings. So in school, um, collaborative learning is extremely efficient. It can help uh, pupils learn better the materials they are exposed to. Um, in jury rooms, so it doesn't always work uh, exactly as in 12 Angry Men, but it seems as if deliberation really does help a uh, jury reach better verdicts. And even when people talk about politics, uh, many experiments have been done in which they bring in citizens and they have, uh, have them talk about policy. After the discussion, people tend to be uh, better informed, so they have kind of you know, better formed opinions. They better understand why other people disagree with them. Um, our thesis is that uh, reason is just another one of the many specialized cognitive mechanisms that humans are endowed with. Its main functions are social. They are the exchanges of justifications and the exchange of reasons, of arguments. On the whole, it does this very well. But by contrast, when we try to do other things with reason, like really try to make better decisions on our own, in many cases it doesn't really work or it can even backfire. Thank you.